And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. Our book of Daniel, again, chapter 7, verse 1, we're going to pick it up with. And uh, this is going to be kind of an exciting chapter, and it might seem a little heavy to some, but that's okay. Tape it, play the tape over, listen carefully. Uh, we're going to get into, uh, before Daniel, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, had a dream, and Daniel interpreted the dream with God's help. In this particular chapter, Daniel is going to have the dream, and an angel will come and interpret it for him. Now, chapter 7 was written three years, I repeat, three years before chapter 6 that we just finished. And I'll explain to you in just a moment. Anytime three years pop up when we are talking about uh, the book of Daniel, as remember Mark 13, Christ said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, and of course, three and a half year periods are brought up quite often in the book of Daniel in the closing chapters. So having said that, uh, let's get right into it, and I think it'll, I can explain why it was written three years before in the verse, for very first verse. Uh, chapter 7, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name, and verse 1 reads, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Now, you'll remember that uh, Belshazzar died in verse, uh, was slain in verse 30 of chapter 5. Okay. I mean, we're, we're talking about this king. He's already dead, all right? So um, this would have happened uh, considerably before. This would be the last king of Babylon. This would be where Babylon would run its course as far as the head of gold is concerned. And this is important. I'll say it this way. You still have the beast image. The head's gone, okay? So you have to take it from there. We will be talking about prophecy in the interpretation of this dream by the angel that has to do with uh, a sequence of kingdoms or dominions, whichever you prefer. And then we will come down to the end times where we're all back together again in one image, which is symbolic of the Antichrist and his reign and officials at the very end. I will explain as we go along and as we continue. So back again, even before Belshazzar dies in verse 30 of chapter 5, verse 2 reads, And Daniel spake and uh, said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. Now, this is an important uh, statement. The four winds bring about the end of this dispensation. The four winds, that means four winds from four directions that center on one point. All right. You will find the four winds spoken of here in this seventh chapter of Daniel. You will hear them written of in Ezekiel chapter 37 concerning Ezekiel prophesying to the dry bones uh, concerning the end of time. And you will read of them in Revelation chapter 7 whereby an angel comes and says, tell the four winds to stop. Hold off the end until all my people have the seal of God in their forehead. That is to say, God's elect that are supposed to know the truth. Don't let the end happen until God's truth is settled in their mind, whereby they're not deceived by the beast that's about to follow. Okay, got it? Uh, in other words, it has a direct to do with the end of uh, this dispensation of time prior to the millennium, pre-millennium. Verse 3, And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. Now, we know from Revelation chapter 13 that the sea is symbolic of people. So we're talking about earthly dynasties here. You might even think of the four hidden dynasties, if you like. Verse 4, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. 
I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Now, man here again uh, is Enosh, and I insist that you keep separate supernatural from mortal. This system is uh, brought to bear from the peoples of the earth, and they are mortal beings, all right? The, the supernatural has not entered the scene yet, okay? But this would be the secession or the um, sequence, not all appearing at one time, but the sequence of the dominions, dominions after the head of gold is gone. Verse 5, And behold, another beast, a second like uh, to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it, and they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. Now, what, what, is, he de what is he devouring? We will find out uh, it's, he's devouring earthly kings. This will be basically the beginning of the supernatural. We know that the bear usually is symbolic of the northern kingdom. But he's devouring flesh. He's devouring earthly kings, all right? Taking them over, in other words. Don't, don't, we won't get real gross here, but um, verse 6. And uh, this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and the beast had also four heads and dominion was given uh, to it. I want, I want you again to think as it is written in Zechariah chapter 1 of the four hidden dynasties. The four ho horns always symbolize power, okay? And uh, I, I'm, I know we're not talking horns here, but that's what the four hidden dynasties are as it is written. It is external powers that are upon the earth and they are very important as we are approaching here to that one that stands all, um, all in all and is supernatural. Verse 7, And this I saw in the night vision, Daniel's dream vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. This means he had two rows of iron teeth. Uh, it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. And of course, these, um, these ten horns are the um, same ten horns that we read of in the... Um, 17th chapter of the book of Revelation and the same as the ten toes. Now, we're talking supernatural here. That's why he can stamp underfoot. That's why he can destroy. That's why, uh, because why? It's Satan's rule. As a matter of fact, we're going to make a little run over here to the 17th chapter of Revelation. Notice uh, in, in the uh, 17th chapter, verse 2 starts with the kings of the earth, meaning Enosh, mortal men. Um, and then we come up to this equivalent in as much as Revelation is kind of an overlay of the great book of Daniel. I want to pick it up with verse 11 because we're talking about this same that most people call the nondescript beast. You can't, nobody can explain it. Well, it's real easy for you to explain and to understand. It is the supernatural fallen angels that come with Satan when Michael kicks them from heaven, Revelation 12, 6, and 7, and they set up their power, and it's only for a very short period of time. We know it, we know it to be brought down to five months because of Revelation chapter 9, okay? Now, verse 11 of Revelation 17, concerning this nondescript or undescribable beast, but it is describable because it's described right here. Verse 11, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. You know who goes into perdition. That's Satan. Only he uh, by name is uh, sentenced. Twelve. And the ten horns 
which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Why? They don't come to earth until the, the uh, time of the uh, beast. When he is cast from heaven, he brings his little lieutenants, the fallen angels, with him, and he establishes them around the earth to take the place of the kings of the earth, that is to say, mortal governments in the nation. You're going to find out what he will do to three of them in a moment in this uh, takeover. Verse 13, we'll return to Daniel. These have one mind. Why? It's one operation. And shall give their power and strength unto the beast. You can count on it. That's where they're going. That's what they're going to do. Let's return, if we may, then to the seventh chapter of Daniel. And there you begin to see the overlay. And again, I must caution you. You, want to, you know that the Antichrist is going to be cast out on this earth. You know that Satan and the fallen angels are here. As it is written in Revelation chapter 12, it says, Rejoice in heaven, they're out of here, they're gone. But woe to you on earth. Why? Because those kings, those ten horns, and that spurious Messiah, they're on this earth, and that's when our work truly gets into overdrive. Verse 8. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up, but the roots, by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. So, uh, and of course, you with companion Bibles, you're very fortunate because it will give you a list of, this is one of the names of the Antichrist. And you will receive there a number of names that uh, are called and are Antichrist uh, listed in your companion column. They go such as the son of perdition, Lucifer, the morning star, which is the opposite of Christ, the morning star, uh, and many other names. Through, um, through the, out the word of God by titles that Satan goes by in the position of spurious Messiah, Antichrist, properly translated from the Greek anti instead of. In other words, he's claiming to be Messiah. And this is why Jesus would say in Mark 13, when they tell you he's in the desert or he is somewhere else, lo, Christ is here or there, don't believe it. As long as you're in a flesh body, it's not him, it's the fake. And um, Lord only knows how many people we have today that claim to be Christ and uh, uh, fool themselves. Okay, then we continue the next verse, verse 9, I believe it is. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. Now, many might say, well, I don't understand that. How could that possibly be? Well, have you, have you never read the first chapter of Ezekiel? When God's throne appeared on earth, what, what was it aboard? It was aboard a circular vehicle, and the word amber, as it is utilized in, I believe it's verse 4 of chapter 1, Ezekiel, means highly polished bronze. And it looked not where it went, meaning it was circular. It didn't have a head or a neck, and it just moved at, at will. And he could see a lot of people inside it and God's throne. And every time the vehicle turned, they did too. Well, naturally, they were aboard it. And for a man that had never seen anything besides a donkey cart, well... He did a pretty good job, and the fire was uh, there from the um, propulsion that is used uh, or appears to be uh, fire, and that's how God's throne is. That's what brought God's throne to earth then, and um, uh, well, I didn't know God needed transportation. The Spirit, hey, no, but he, this was his throne and his authority, and he's coming to end this. 
immediately following the Antichrist. Okay? And um, so you don't have to, God is a consuming fire. Now this brings this picture down to the last days. Because God himself, through the Son, is not going to return to this earth with the throne until he's ready to overthrow and destroy the supernatural operation of Satan as it is described in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, as well as many places in the great book of Revelation. Verse 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, and thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set. In other words, the great white throne judgment. And the books were opened. That doesn't happen until even the end of the millennium. So we have moved considerably. God's bringing an army back. He's taking charge. There are some here that will be changed instantly that are a part of that army today. Teaching truth, uh, planting seeds, and preparing for this secession, which is really quite simple. The main key is separating natural from supernatural or enosh from nephilim, which is to say fallen angels uh, by mortal, from mortal man. Now, uh, it would appear uh, at this point that uh, these, um, these uh, nephilim, fallen angels, the ten horns, the ten kings, that they, why do they not appear until the Antichrist does? Well, because he's the one that gives them power and they're kicked out of heaven at the same time. That's why. I would say to you, if you are looking for the deadly wound, you're probably hearing it described there, okay? Now let's go on to the next verse, if we may. Verse 11. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed, and uh, given to the burning flame. In other words, the political system, the ten kings, and which is really a religious system, and the role of Antichrist, I'll repeat it again. We're talking here about the governmental, religious, and political operation of Satan at the sixth trump, when he comes to this earth to rule and reign, at the end of uh, this dispensation of time and just prior to the millennium, they are, they are cast into the lake of fire before the millennium even begins. Which means what? God's a consuming fire. Uh, do you know where that's written? It's written in the 19th chapter of the great book of Revelation. Made very clear there why they're cast into the burning fire. Uh, pick it up with me, Revelation chapter 20. You're going to have it on the screen. Uh, Revelation chapter 19, rather, verse 20. And it reads, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet. The false prophet is one of the names of Antichrist, if you check me out, okay? It's one of the names of the Antichrist. He, that particular role, not Satan, but his role as Antichrist in that religious system, naturally, you know that 7,000 die instantly at the seventh trump. Well, this kind of lets you know who they are, okay? The ten kings and their cohorts and the system. It is written in the 11th chapter of Revelation when the two witnesses rise from the street and Christ sets foot on earth, 7,000 instantly die that are against us. That's this this system, it's over, okay? And the beast was taken with, his false, with the false prophet that wrought miracles before him in the sight of men. I be Jesus, okay? Uh, uh, miracles before him with which he deceived them that had re received the mark of the beast, that means the lie in their mind, rather than the seal of God, which is the truth of this word before the fact, and them that worshiped his image, these both, that's to say, the spurious Messiah, Antichrist, 
and his system, that power and authority is they were both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And, uh, and uh, let's go one more verse, 21. And the remnant were, were, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. This is that great white horse that Jesus rides in, not the one the false Messiah in chapter 6 of Revelation rides. Uh, with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, the word of God. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. It was over. And, of course, the millennium would begin instantly at that time. So you see, it isn't difficult to just allow the, this uh, truth from God just to flow, and it gives you a look even into what is yet future and how the governmental systems will do. What are you looking for? Well, right now, your next great important uh, thing to happen would be the deadly wound of a one world system that is earthly. That is to say, uh, politi uh, political rulers, country rulers, dictators around the world. In other words, I'm saying they would all be mortal man. Tries to put something together. But the very instant that the ten horns appear, there's a deadly wound. And it's healed instantly by the little horn, or that is to say the Antichrist, which in the book of Revelation is called the dragon. Returning to the, to the book of Daniel, let's pick it up if we may with the 12th verse, continuing. The 12th verse reads, As concerning the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season of time. Well, why? Well, up until the end of the millennium when the second death takes place. That is to say, Satan, even himself, is cast into the abyss, locked in, but he doesn't die until that season of time is over with, called the end of the millennium, when he again tempts those that come out of Babylon or confusion during even the time of the millennium. And if you dare call that a second chance, you're ignorant of God's word. Okay, these all this last uh, supernatural, instead of Christ, government and entity, all coexist. They were not a string as back in three and four of of uh, do, of um, dominions or kingdoms down through the period of time. You were in the last days here. Verse thirteen, I saw in the night visions, and behold. One like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. In other words, you have the Father and the Son, those offices and the office of the teaching during the millennium. 14, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him and his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Uh, never again. Of course, this brings us to the end, of course, when the eternal kingdom, but, but know this. Once his kingdom is established on the first day of the millennium, it'll never be destroyed again. He's here to stay. He's not coming back this time born to babe and to be crucified. He's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords, and it's going down the way it is written. Okay? So um, here we have that time, that period of time that Christ returns. I don't know. Are you going to be in that army? Where are you going to be in all this? Because it's going to happen in this generation of the fig tree. Verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. Daniel didn't have the opportunity, as you do today, to have known the history of 1948 when Israel again became a nation. Both the good and the bad fig were planted there, and all these prophecies of the end times are, uh, are uh, coming together 
and we see it. Many of the prophets wanted to live in this generation. You do. So live and learn. Keep your eyes open, watchmen, and watch. But Daniel had trouble. He's going to need some help, and this will even clarify it further for you. 16. I came near unto one of them that stood by, an angel, and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. Again, I want to say, this dream, unlike Nebuchadnezzar's that Daniel interpreted, this dream was had by Daniel and will be interpreted by an angel of Almighty God. Verse 17. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall rise, arise out of the earth, uh, and meaning they're earthly people. All right, You can count on it. We, we even know at this time who they were. The, we know from having already jumped one chapter that the Medes took over to move to another. Verse 18. But the saints, that's set aside ones, God's children, of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever, meaning eternal. I don't know which, you know, I can't understand why people have trouble making up which team they wish to be on. I, to me, it seems rather obvious. You have a choice to live or die. And to live does not mean live in the flesh, but to live eternally with all kinds of blessings Verse 19, then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured and break in pieces and stomped the residue with his feet. Uh, in other words, meaning the, the deception of many people. Verse 20. And the ten horns. Now we're right back at the end again. This is for you. Okay, this hasn't this is future, hasn't happened yet. And the ten horns that were in his head, that means he brought them with him when he was cast from heaven, his little fallen angels. They weren't here on earth. They were in his head. And of the other which came up, that's to say the spurious Messiah, the role that he did not play in heaven, but will play on earth. And before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes, the little horn, meaning instead of Christ, and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I mean, as it is written, in Revelation chapter 13, what is it, verse 12? Yeah, in verse uh, 11 and 12, it stipulates there that, uh, hey, he looks like a lamb. He has two horns just like the lamb, meaning he looks like Jesus. I, I mean, he looks like more so than that, the lamb slain. But what is this? When we listen, his voice is uh, as a dragon, meaning he was the dragon, meaning he was Satan. This is why that you must study the great book of Daniel and Revelation almost uh, uh, as a lay overlay, as you've heard me say many times, because between the two, one gets a pretty complete picture of exactly, exactly what con culminates the end of time and consummates the return of Jesus Christ, the seventh trump. And, but probably is more important to you, to you now, is what it is you're supposed to be doing during that time whereby you are found pleasing to your heavenly Father. Verse 21, I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Well, that, that sounds really bad. Well, wh wh what are you supposed to be? You're supposed to be delivered up before the synagogue of Satan, Mark 13, New Testament, right there, words of Jesus. It doesn't mean he can take over your mind. You have power over all of your enemies. But Christ has the destiny that you're not to premeditate what you will say beforehand, Mark 13, I'm quoting from, when you're delivered up before the synagogue of Satan, which is to say the Antichrist, but you are to speak that that the Holy Spirit gives you at that moment when 
as it is written in Acts chapter 2 concerning the uh, Holy Spirit, that both sons and daughters will be delivered up and witnessed before this one. He speaks great words. It'll deceive most people that are, that are not founded in the Word of God. They're going to think that he, not, that he claims to be Christ, but they're going to believe that he is Christ because of the miracles. Verse 22. Un, uh, he, he will deliver them up. They will speak. 22. Until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. I mean, we're here to stay. We're taking over. This is it, friend. The saints will have the victory. Verse 23. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms. Here we got the nondescript, okay? And shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Uh, you'll find no history of that, why it hasn't happened yet. But I assure you of one thing, it's going to happen. It is, and, and you'll have a better description of it before we finish this book of uh, Daniel. It sounds a little coarse here, the way he trumps it down and just tears it up. Do you know how he does it? You're going to find out that he does it peacefully and with flatteries. He does it playing Jesus. That's why he will deceive so many people. They're looking, as they have been taught by most churches, you got a lot of good churches. You got a lot of churches that don't really feed God's word, though. And they are teaching a fallacy that began in the year 1830 called any moment doctrine. Um, According to them, God had no reason for teaching you the book of Revelation or Daniel or any of the events that transpire in the end times. Why? They tell you you're going to be gone. There's just one problem. That's a lie. That is an untruth that can cost a man his soul in ignorance, at least make him ashamed and crying and undeserving before Almighty God when they might have sat in a pew in the front row of a church all their life starving for food and never being fed the word of God or truth or having the prophecies explained as they should be. Hey, you don't have a right to interpret this. An angel is interpreting it for you. It's not to be argued with. So, hey, if I were you, I wouldn't miss any of these lectures in Daniel. It gets better as we go along. One word of caution. Be sure and note the difference between mortal man and the supernatural entities that Satan will establish, it most likely gives you, I said most likely gives you the clue to the deadly wound whereby you start Mark and time, the end would be near. All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment. Won't you?